Would you like to learn the questions that I ask cloud architects, enterprise architects, security architects, AI architects, network architects, and other architects to see if I could hire them? If so, this video is for you. Hi, my name's Mike Gibbs. I'm an enterprise architect with about 25 years experience in all architecture roles. I've been a hiring manager for decades, and I can tell you I've done over 6,000 interviews for various architect positions and sales engineer positions over the last 25 years. Now, when we interview a cloud architect or an enterprise architect or a security architect, we have to check two things. One is, do they have the technical depth and knowledge to be able to do the job? And the other is, do they have the business skills that are necessary to do the job? Because if we look at an architecture role, it's not an engineering role. Between 60 and 80% of the role is most likely business and 20 to 40% of the role based upon where you're working potentially could be technical. So I ha have to check both tech questions and business questions. So these enterprise architecture questions, cloud architecture questions are gonna be business questions. These are gonna be very deep questions and they will immediately answer the question, can I hire this person for an architect role or not? Does this person understand how to create a strategy for a client to enhance their business performance? Or does this person only know the tech? So I'm going to give you the kind of questions that I ask. Now, if you ask other tech leaders and other tech executives, they ask similar questions. And we're all looking for an understanding of, can you understand the business? Do you understand the business goals? And how can you devise a strategy for that organization? Now, the first question I ask all enterprise architects, cloud architects, and other architects is what is business architecture? What are the components of business architecture? And why is it critical to get this right before we think about a technology architecture? Now, that is a huge question that I'm asking, and it's going to give me a lot of information. So the reason I'm asking this first is what is business architecture? The first, if you don't understand how the business is aligned or is designed, you won't know how to design a technology strategy that's going to work. So this is going to be really critical. So what is business architecture? Business architecture involves things uh, is really about the way the organization works. So it will involve things such as an organizational chart. It will involve things such as the business processes or how certain things get done inside of that organization. And it typically includes an, a component of value streams, which is how the organization compete, achieves competitive advantage along the way. Now, because that tells you how the organization operates and the way it needs to work, if we if we design the organization right and we understand what the organization needs and we understand what the employees need and if we understand what's causing the employees pain in their positions and how they could do their job better, then we know the way the company needs to run. Now, that means we can design a technology strategy giving that employee exactly what they need to do their job better in the most efficient way, which means aligning people, processes, and technology. And that's why business architecture is so critical. If you don't know what the business problem you're trying to solve is and how the business operates and the way it needs to work or should work, any piece of technology you design most likely won't help the organization. And that's why 80% of architectures fail to provide any value. Get this right, and you will provide incredible experience and some real digital transformation for your client. Now, really, I need you to understand the key of any architecture role is the ability to manage stakeholders and understand stakeholders' needs and get them aligned. So the biggest question I usually ask next is, what is a stakeholder? Describe your approach to working with stakeholders and getting their input and buy-in and why that matters. Because that, again, is going to tell me, does this person understand architecture? Or maybe they've got great engineering skills, but they don't have an architecture background and we need to be trained in architecture. So a stakeholder is going to be any individual group or even a company that has an interest in and is affected by the decisions that are made inside of that organization and can influence the decisions of a project or an outcome and say, yes, no, we can do this, or no, we can't even have this architecture in the first place. So when I think of a stakeholder, basically speaking, your leaders are stakeholders. You ask your leaders who are the key stakeholders, who could be department heads, for example. They could be go-to people. But the key here is you, in order to design a strategy that's going to work is you need to understand what the stakeholders need, understand 
can from them, what their team members need, what their employees' pain points are, for example, and get that. Now, when you work with the stakeholders, you then bring that information to your architecture team. Your architecture team can then devise a strategy that they think will work, and you give that information back to the stakeholders, and they'll give you feedback that this will help this, but hurt here. Try something different. This will make this better. This will make this worse. Try something over here. So that gives us the ability to keep improving the design until we know what's going to work for our client's goal. Now, that to me is critical. Now, I also know that if I've worked with the clients and, and the employees work with the clients and the stakeholders the entire time, and the stakeholders were part of every decision and they were part of the design, when it's time to sell the architecture, they're going to say yes. And when it's time for the engineers to go build the architecture that we cloud architects or enterprise architects designed, when it's time for that, they're going to support the initiative. And that's going to be part of any architectural change is changing the culture. And that's going to come partially from the buy-in of the stakeholders and the marketing collateral you take around the new architecture. So that's why stakeholders are so critical. Now, the next thing that I understand, I ask is the person to describe the concept of opportunity cost and how opportunity cost is used or thought of to make decisions. Now, the reason I, I ask that question is that's gonna tell me a lot about the person's business acumen. Do they have the business acumen to be an architect or not? And because I want the person to know that an organization has limited resources because we're, we have to spend an organization's resources widely. I also want that person to know that if they spend the resources on something, they may not have other resources somewhere else because you can't spend your money twice. That means that everything you do or don't do, you have to determine what's best for the organization. Now, organizations make decisions like this. If they've got $1 million and this one's projected to return $8 million and this one's projected to return $3 million, they take the $8 million, generally speaking, because it's a higher return on investment. Which means if you're a good architect, what you need to understand is that organization has multiple opportunities where they can spend their money on your work or on something else. So that means you have to make sure your organization, your your solution or architecture provides a competitive advantage. And that also needs that means you need to be able to build a business case or an ROI model to show that yours is the right one. And that's part of the secret to selling an architecture is showing that your architecture is going to pay for itself. It's going to provide business value to the organization and that it could be the best return on the on investment the company could spend. So that's why you need to be able to understand the concept of opportunity cost and the way businesses use it. Now, the next question I ask really is basically a finance question. And it gives me the person's understanding. Do they understand uh, financial structure or capital structure, the way an organization could receive money that it could use to do things and how the organization can use the resources that it has or debt or other things. So the question I like to ask is a company has, say, a weighted average cost of capital of 7.3%. How would you use that information to determine if a workload will be cheaper in a data center or a public cloud? Now, this question tells me so much. So weighted average cost of capital is the average blended cost of capital an organization would have either to say uh, issue stock and or, per, or and or borrow with loans that cost the average between them. Now, why does that matter? Well, if an organization is flush with cash, it may make sense for them to purchase something now, if an organization is not flush with cash, the organization may determine leasing options, financing options, what have you. So the key here is how would I look at it? I would look at it in terms of the workload. So let's say, for example, I wanted to run a server that threaded, say, 384 physical cores on that server or 768 virtual cores, 8 to terabytes of DRAM, and I want to put a certain number of virtual machines that are going to have a certain number of storage on that server, I can look and see what that costs in an average cloud, and it's about 4 or $5 million over the course of three years. Now, in certain cases, that same server could be $300,000. And then people would say, what if they don't have the $300,000 to buy that server? The point is knowing they don't have to. At that rate, about 7.3%, they could finance the server for about $90,000 a year. Uh, or they could lease the server for about uh, eighty thousand dollars a year for about a three to four year payment structure. Doing in math in my head, so the point being is that organization could say this workload is cheaper to finance 
and put it in the data center. Or we don't want to take a, a loan and we don't want the debt on our balance sheet. We could take it as a lease and that way it'll be an operational expense, not a capital expense. So again, that's knowing, does the person understand capital structure? Does that or person understand the, how a business could strategically use debt or not? Instead of just saying, we have to go to the cloud or we have to go to the data center, be able to calculate it, weigh it out, and truly understand cloud costs ahead of time, not after the fact. Now, if I'm interviewing someone for, say, a solutions architect job or a job at a vendor where they're going to have to be selling things in the world, I like to ask this question. Could you define the RFP process and what it takes to lead an RFP response? Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar, a request for proposal it typically is associated with a big architecture. A client will issue a request for proposal and it'll go to several companies. It may have uh, it may have 100 or 200 pages of questions in this RFP. And the point is, is that RFP is going to evaluate your solution or compared to other vendors. And uh, it's going to be a formalized process. So the key is if you're strategic and you're working with the client long term, you can influence that RFP to be things that you do best compared to your competition. If you're not strategic, your account team wouldn't know to do that in the first place. The account team being things like an account manager, solutions architect, sales engineer, that type of thing. Now, when you get that RFP, it is going to be infeasible for you to create a response to 200 pages of questions. So part of the RFP process when you receive that RFP is to create an RFP team, being able to find the subject matter experts that can help you respond to that RFP in a period of time. Maybe getting a project manager to make sure everybody gets you things on time. Maybe you project manage it. And being able to take other people's information, delegate it out, have it come to you, have you harmonize it into an RFP response that uh, feels like it was all written by one person before you send it off to proposal the proposals team, which will have attorneys view it, potentially some writers that'll clean it up, that kind of thing. Now that is the process. And I can tell if a person ever or understand sales or understands architecture because that's going to be a key component. So as you can see, these five questions, there's a lot more to them than what you just see than what you look at them. The last question is really, do you understand sales and the sales processes? The previous question was a, of cost of capital was understanding, God, uh, does an organic person understand finance, capital structure, and how they could use an organization's question. The concept of opportunity cost gives me everything about the person's understanding of business strategy, return on investment, and knowing that you can only spend your money in one place. So you've got to convince those architecture stakeholders that your investment's the best. Understanding uh, the question before that about stakeholders, is the person even going to be capable of doing any of their job? Do they understand what a stakeholder is, what a stakeholder's needs are, how to make the stakeholders happy, how to get their buy-in, how to get their support, and how to make it better with stakeholders? If they don't, they're not really going to be able to do the job. And the first question I asked, that we'll go over it again, is what is business architecture? Business architecture, the optimal business architecture designs that de defines this the technology, that business strategy, and the technology should map to that strategy. Because any effective cloud architecture, enterprise architecture will align people, processes, and technology. So those were my favorite business questions to ask architects on an interview. If you would like to become a cloud architect or an enterprise architect, or maybe some of these questions are, are, were a little unfamiliar to you, why don't you join me in a How to Become an Architect webinar? I run one every single week. You can find that the link will be in the description of the role. We'll talk about what we do as architects, the skills that you need as cloud architects or enterprise architects, security architects, any architect you really want, even though it says cloud architect webinar, I'll go through for you. We'll talk about what we do. We'll talk about how to stand out. We'll talk about how to go straight to the hiring manager so you don't get blocked by HR. We'll talk about what certifications you need. It's a free webinar. Sign up. We can even I'll answer questions you have on Zoom, face-to-face -face conversation. Look forward to meeting you. Now, we also have architecture programs for every architecture crown or career you can think of, cloud architect, enterprise architect, AI architect, security architect, and network architect, that kind of thing. So check that out. Now, and if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell to be notified of new videos to assist you in your cloud architect career, enterprise architect career, AI architect career, security architect career. This is Mike Gibbs signing off for now, and I hope to see you in another video or free webinar very soon.